Greetings viewers, welcome to another episode of CSEC Circle, a program in which we look at poems on the CXC English B literature syllabus. To my left, Ms. Vanessa Glasgow of the Lord School, and to my right, Mr. Jermaine Wilcher of the Springer Memorial. Listen now to a reading of Stuart Brown's West Indies, USA. West Indies, USA by Stuart Brown. Cruising at 30,000 feet above the endless green, the island seems like dice tossed on a casino's bays. Some come up lucky, others not. Puerto Rico takes a pot, the Dallas of the West Indies. Silver linings on the clouds as we descend are hallmarked. San Juan glitters like a maverick's gold ring. All across the Caribbean, we'd collected terminals. Airports are like calling cards, cultural fingerprints. The handwritten signs at Port-au-Prince, Piarco's sleazy tourist art, the lethargic contempt of the baggage boys at Verbird in St. John's, and now for a plush San Juan. But the pilot's bland, you're safe in my hands drawl, crackles as we land. U.S. regulations demand all passengers not disembarking at San Juan, stay on the plane. I repeat, stay on the plane. Subtle Uncle Sam. Afraid too many desperate blacks might re-enslave this island of the free. Might jump the barbed electric fence around America's backyard and claim that vaunted sanctuary. Give me your poor. Through toughened tinted glass, the contrasts tantalize. U.S. patrol cars glide along the shimmering tarmac, containering baggage trucks and load with fierce efficiency. So soon, we are climbing. Low above the pulsing city streets, galvanized shanties overseen by condominiums, polished Cadillacs shimming past rasters with pushcarts. And as we climb, San Juan's fool's glitter calls to mind the shattered innards of a TV set that's fallen off the back of a lorry. All painted valves and circuits, the road like twisted wires. The bright cars, microchips. It's sharp and jagged and dangerous and belong to someone else. Anybody who's familiar with the history of the West Indies or the Caribbean, as it might be more popularly known, knows that certainly prior to the 20th century or the middle of the 20th century, two of the things which have dominated this region are colonization and slavery. This is an important reminder of that historical background because of its application to Stuart Brown's West Indies, USA. Vanessa, for somebody who does not know the geography of this part of the world, the title of this poem wouldn't be anything unusual, would it? But for us who know the geography, why would we be shocked by the title of this poem, West Indies, USA? The West Indies is not a part of the USA, but based on the way that the title is structured, it would give the idea that it is. And in case you're not clear with where I'm coming from, Let's use the typical mailing address as an example. All right, so you get a piece of mail and you look at the location of the person who sent it. So for example, you see something like Silver Hill on one line, the line underneath Christchurch, the third line, Barbados. Now the understanding is that the area indicated by the line above is a subset or is a part of the area indicated by the line beneath. Mm -hmm. so, so following that logic, you have Silver Hill, which is a part of Christchurch, which in turn is a part of Barbados. Yes. So when we look at the title West Indies USA, it is insinuating that the West Indies is a part of the USA. So already you have the strong message of ownership and possession. And it's not even um, a single territory. We're not singling out Jamaica or Trinidad or St. Kitts. No, mm -hmm. the West Indies. A handful of islands all belong to the USA, like you would own a phone. Mm -hmm. So 
as alert readers, we would recognize that this poem is going to be satirical in nature. The writer and perhaps the speaker are making a political criticism that the very title of the poem alerts us to. Now, this title, therefore, points us to this theme of control or perceived control. But let's talk about the form of the poem first. Jermaine, this poem falls into two parts internally, one might argue, right? What happens in the first part? Well, basically what's happening in West Indies, we say in the first part is that you get an idea of the persona who has traveled extensively throughout the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. He has now come to San Juan or landed on, in San Juan and he's waiting to take off with the tarmac again. And he's going through or he is observing what is happening on the tarmac in San Juan. And sharing his thoughts with us. And he's sharing his thoughts right. with us. So verse one mm -hmm. and part of verse two deal with the persona traveling at 30,000 feet in the air mm -hmm. across various Caribbean territories. Mm -hmm. And by the end of verse two, he's come to San Juan. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the poem is reflective of his observations, as Jermaine said, and his thoughts about what he observes. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, when we look at the appearance of the poem on the page, we notice that verse one begins flush on the left-hand margin, but from verse two to the end, the first line is indented. What, in terms of word processing, we might call right justified. Mm -hmm. So that literally, our eyes are forced to treat verses two to the end as a distinct part from verse one, even though it, they're all part of the totality of the poem. Mm -hmm. To reinforce the persona's focus on his observations and his thoughts while in the plane on the tarmac in San Juan. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So, Vanessa, you had some interesting thoughts about some of the diction of the first and I think final verses of the poem and the implications for how the Caribbean has historically been seen by European countries and America people who've owned at various times all of the Caribbean, the mm -hmm. French, the Spanish, the Dutch, the English, and in later times, or a lot of times, the Americans. Share those thoughts with us, please. Well, historically, the Caribbean has been seen as a commodity, something, or a place, I should say, that is able to generate revenue, all right? So, um, especially in agricultural terms, you can see how the European countries have over centuries been able to profit from sugarcane and mm -hmm. cotton, etc. All right. And so we can see a similar interest in exploitation from the very beginning of the poem. And diction ways, these are the words that would alert you to these exploitative interests. Casinos bays. Pot, silver linings, hallmark, glitters, gold ring. All of these, of course, speak about success and wealth. All right. When you come down to the final stanza, microchips is something that you should pay particular attention to. Now, the reason why the cars that the speaker observes are compared to microchips is not only with reference to the size, but more importantly with reference to the ability of the United States to control San Juan or Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you're thinking of microchips, when you chip something, it's very common, for example, to chip animals these days. The common argument being that if they are lost, you can easily track them. All right. You can so, identify the owner. And you can identify the owner. Or the owner can identify them, the belonging. And, mm -hmm. Right. So do you have that idea of the United States being able to dictate the future and the activity of its territory, which would be Puerto Rico? Mm hmm all right, and of course, it will serve the interests of the United States to do so because if you look back at stanza one, Puerto Rico is distinct from the rest of the West Indies, even geographically speaking. Um, there is mention made of the clouds, so even within the airspace of the Caribbean. Puerto Rico, when the, 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 the plane is in that region, it, it is seen that. 
it is so valuable to the United States in particular that even the, the clouds are hallmarked. And even when you look at jewelry, when a piece of jewelry is hallmarked, it shows that it is authentic, it's not costume. And you can identify that through the etching on some part of the jewelry, the earring post, or near to the clasp of the chain. That's why it means to be hallmarked. So you can see that imagery coming out there. So as it were, the United States has put its stamp on Puerto Rico, including the airspace. Yes. Now we know that historically, um, the USA has had a very physical presence in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. in the form of a military base. Yes. How is this related to the geopolitical relations with the United States and Russia and you know the big power players in the world? Well, what, what would have prompted America to have a military outpost, so to speak, in Puerto Rico? Um, that came about because they wanted to keep an eye, in, like, between in the 1950s, 1960s, coming up to the 1970s, the whole idea of communism. Mm -hmm. So they were afraid that communism would spread, so they wanted to keep an eye on Cuba. So strategically um puerto rico was is in that area where they can keep an eye on or they can monitor cuba and what they were doing in terms of communism so that's what they did with puerto rico so that this idea of surveillance mm -hmm. historically is echoed in the word and the imagery of the microchip that you pointed to Vanessa towards yes. the end of the poem. Mm -hmm. So this association between surveillance, the United States, Puerto Rico, and the West Indies is nothing new. Mm -hmm. Historically, it was there with a physical presence, and today it could be there in the form of a digital presence, so to speak. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So in the first um, couple verses, particularly in verse 2, the speaker, who is unidentified, we don't mm -hmm. know definitely who this person is, but obviously, as you said, I'm Jermaine, somebody who's traveled across the Caribbean, yeah. paints a less than flattering picture, at least of the airports in various territories, right? Yeah. So that we can see that he or she has no particular love for the appearance of the Caribbean if the airports are symbolic of the Caribbean and his attitude to it. What are some of the words that he uses to describe these airports and give us a sense of his attitude to them? He says... Um sleazy tourist art, mm -hmm. lethargic contempt of baggage boys mm -hmm. at Fair Bird in St. In, in John's. In John's. Um, and then he contrasts so that with... No, plush San Juan. Right, and the word plush is a really important word because it is associated with wealth and luxury, luxury which reinforces your point, um, mm -hmm. Vanessa, about the commodification of the Caribbean or the West Indies as far as Europeans are concerned, the colonizing power is rather historical or relatively recent like the United States. Mm -hmm. So he's expecting a very different experience when he comes to San Juan, Puerto Rico from what he's had when he's gone to the other airports in the Caribbean. Correct. So what does he actually find when he gets there? I think he's disappointed because it seems um, in the first, in the second stanza, when he says plus San Juan, that his expectation that this is going to be some place completely and totally different from what he experienced in the other countries. But as we read on, it seems to be a bit worse because when we take into consideration the reputation that the USA has champions of the defenseless mm -hmm. and protectors and liberators and, and stuff like that. When we think about them having anything, that them being the USA, having anything to do with a country, you would expect that the country would be prospering. But the image that we get of San Juan outside of the barricaded airport is one that is very telling. But let's Pause there, um, okay. Jermaine, for a little bit. And let's go to Vanessa. Okay. Who is going to elaborate on that very important point that you made? The image that America gives to the world or wants to give to the world of itself. Vanessa, follow up on that first, please. All right. So when you hear the word image, the mm -hmm. first thing that comes to your mind is picture. Mm -hmm. All right. Now look at the penultimate stanza. There is a line in there that says, 
the shattered innards of a TV set that's fallen off the back of a lorry, all painted valves and circuits. All right. Now, when you are watching your favorite film on TV, your favorite TV series, whatever the case is, you are literally watching a picture. All right. But that is just the surface. There's inner workings that's responsible for projecting that image that you are appreciating. All right. So going back to what you said and, and taking into consideration his reference to Puerto Rico as plush, there is an outside or a superficial projection of this territory of the U.S. that they like to show off, one of prosperity and wealth, all right? But a closer inspection would reveal that there's more to Puerto Rico than wealth because there's a kind of duality. There is coexistence of wealth and poverty. That is why you see the juxtapositioning of things like the Rastas with push carts mm -hmm. and the Cadillacs. You see the shanties and the condos. So what we are forced to acknowledge by the end of the poem is that as wealthy as Puerto Rico is, there are still alarming levels of poverty. Not everyone is well off. Not everyone is satisfied. All right. So that, that thing about the image is very important because the image that is projected that is projected, sorry, of Puerto Rico is not necessarily faithful to reality. And thus we can appreciate the reference in the penultimate verse to San Juan's fool's glitter. In other words, the thing that looks like gold, that mm -hmm. looks like a sign of wealth, mm -hmm. um, to paraphrase Shakespeare from the Merchant of Venice, all that glisters is not gold. Yes? Yes, sir. No. Vanessa, I want you to address something else as well. In this poem, we have a quotation that comes from an iconic um, statue in America. Give me your poor. All right. So that is an inscription that you will find along the base of the Statue of Liberty. All right. The association between the Statue of Liberty and America is immediate. Everyone is familiar with that image. Now, this invitation sounds generous, but it is quite hypocritical. Um, in reality, it is hardly ever practiced. All right. So the invitation ostensibly is sent out to all. If you are poor, come. I will revive you. I will replenish you. I will satisfy you. I am the generous. Dream. Mm -hmm. The dream. The streets are lined with gold. Yes. It's kind of like the Canaan of the Western Hemisphere. Exactly. The promised land. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that the message is not genuine. Because in that same stanza, and coming down to the end of the preceding stanza, you see some diction which is very aggressive, very hostile, very divisive. Now, I'm speaking particularly about barbed electric fence around America's backyard, as well as vaunted sanctuary, all right? So on one hand, people are invited to come to America, a vaunted sanctuary, some, some place that you can find rest and, and come to revive yourself, catch yourself, so to speak, as you will say here. But Live yet the dream, there, fulfill the dream. Improve your material circumstances. Improve. But then how can you improve if there is an electric fence? So it tells me that those who are issued this invitation are actually part of a select few. It's not as all-encompassing as it may sound. And then when you look even closely at the whole reference to America's backyard, that I think leads back to the significance of the title, West Indies, USA. It's all to do with possession. West Indies is a part of the USA. When you think about backyard, the backyard is behind the main property. The so inferior it's always, section of the property. Yeah, inferior and also still very much a part of. So I think that that there is something that we ought to pay attention to, the, the kind of 
hypocrisy that Brown is trying to expose about America. You can't take the invitation and what they say and what they declare about themselves as a nation at face value because in reality, they don't want everyone. And um, Jermaine, following up on Vanessa's observations, the persona does actually identify a specific category of people that America is interested in keeping from free and white access to Puerto Rico. Right. Um, that is in the third stanza at the, at the third line from the ending. Subtle Uncle Sam afraid too many desperate blacks might reinstate this island of the free, might jump the barbed electric fence around America's backyard and claim that vaunted sanctuary. Give me your poor. Give me your poor. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about the significance of this line, because of course we are living in 2019, the 21st century. We know about Black Lives Matter and all the challenges that that represents. And here is, Stuart Brown is actually a British white man who's writing a poem about the relationship between the West Indies and USA. Tell us a little bit more about this concern with keeping black people out of what is in essence a Caribbean nation. I, I think it lends to the whole idea of exploitation and them, when they say exploitation, they're carding off one part, which is the airport in San Juan, and that is theirs, and that is our sacred piece. We don't want anything here to taint this part, this part of what supposedly is ours. So when it says too many desperate blacks and how they capitalize the word island, all right, which makes it seem distinctly Caribbean. Mm -hmm. However, what I see here is the whole idea of Stuart Brown trying to show that this here, Puerto Rico, is a part of the Carib Caribbean and you are here, so you need to take care of us as well. So it must be more all inclusive instead of just a separation of this particular type of people. Um, I think that's what he's trying to get across in this, uh, this line. So, Vanessa, would you agree with Jermaine then that, as it were, Stuart Brown as a poet is using this criticism of the current relations between America and Puerto Rico, and by implication, America and the Caribbean, to argue for a partnership rather than dominance and control on the part of America? You know, I, I'm not even sure if the idea of partnership is a feasible one. Mm -hmm. I think that the national attitude and approach of the U.S. has never been able to entertain the idea of egalitarianism. I don't think so. I think that it has to do more with give us the option of determining our fate and charting our own course. Right, which is why I think he is so pointed in the conclusion of the poem, and more particularly when he says, and belonged to someone else. Well, read the words just before that, because those are really important words too. True. <laughs> it's sharp and jagged and dangerous, and belonged to someone else. So, taking into consideration your suggestion, then he is seen, he is implying it was seen that if things continue the way that they are as in with america having the upper hand and dictating the affairs of puerto rico it would actually spell out their demise there is no way for both parties to profit equally someone must always get the shorter end of the stick and in this case of course it would be puerto rico so the only way out of this then would be for puerto rico to have greater autonomy or autonomy in the first place mm -hmm. i think i think that this kind of contributes to the tone that of possession a kind of territorial tone that i picked out with reference to afraid too many desperate blacks might reenslave this island of the free. And when you look at your text, you're going to notice that island begins with a capital I and it is also italicized. And so it is very assertive, very strident in its claim, which is you may see me 
if the speaker is indeed a Caribbean national, we don't know for sure, but you may see the inhabitants of this region as property. But at the end of the day, it is not that you own us, we own ourselves. Hence, the focus on I through the italics and the capitalization of the very letter. Thank you, Vanessa and Jermaine. Viewers, I would just add one thing. Google it for yourself. Many Caribbean countries that were once the possessions of Britain, France, Spain, Holland, and so forth are now independent. But Puerto Rico continues to exist in a kind of limbo, a kind of nightmarish no man's land. In a manner of speaking, it is part of the United States. Yet the sad reality is it does not enjoy many of the benefits and privileges that being one of the 50 American states would normally and should confer. The citizens of Puerto Rico don't have the same rights and privileges and freedoms. And if you recall, just a year or two ago, Puerto Rico was struck by a hurricane that created a great degree of devastation. And there are many testimonies about the inadequacy of America's response, being the richest nation on earth, to meet the desperate needs of these people who supposedly are part of that political entity. So you can understand Stuart Brown's logic in choosing Puerto Rico as the country whose relations with the United States say something unflattering about how America exerts its influence in the Caribbean. So that even though geographically we are supposed to be a separate region, in a sense the mentality of American government po um, po politicians is that the West Indies is the backyard of the United States. We are the ones with power and control and influence. We may offer a spoken invitation, but our actions do not, as Vanessa and Jermaine brilliantly highlighted, line up with our words. So in essence, we have a hypocritical relationship which Stuart Brown is satirizing as a poet. This has been another episode of CSEC Circle.